rushing now. Thank you. <laughs> Bill, you're still the one. Oh, Dave, I figured that. Thank you very much again. Wow, that was what they played last time I spoke two years ago at uh, the Outrigger. And the prayer was about sunshine again today. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me to this Rotary Cup. Uh, it's always a pleasure. I see two of my old friends not here. That's Phil and Fred Black. I don't know if they're still a member, but <laughs> miss them. Phil, Phil's over at uh, Cindy's granddaughter. Oh, that's that first granddaughter, yeah. Anyway, uh, I'm very happy to be here. I know that I'm not sure why I'm here, particularly if it's for being president and CEO of GVB or, or the uh, head of the Council of Economic Development for, for the governor or the licensing and permitting czar. That's a great name. But that didn't come just by chance. It came because it's a requirement if you're going to do something. You gotta wear that swastika hat or whatever they call that and, and go out there and get some things done because it has been in the past Simply everything was going on in fits and starts when you do something. Something's going to be stumbling in the way, so the governor saw fit that uh, every time we invite investors to come here, they come here, and what we do is we give them a, a bush cutter for them to bush cut their way to the permitting and licensing process. And eventually they all leave, disgusted and frustrated. So the governor said, I'm going to ask you to, to go and find out what the real problem is uh, of that licensing and permitting. And uh, so I got my trusted people that work for me, uh, Patrick Sherman and Jeff Marcheso and Ed Camacho. And we went out and searched what is the problem. We found out that the problem is from the beginning is that over the last five decades, all these licensing and permitting laws have been put in place, one on top of the other for 50 years and then it suddenly became incongruent. And even if they're congruent, the different departments read it differently. So what I've asked Patrick, and he's getting close to putting a, uh, an omnibus bill together, shaking everything up in the, in the uh, uh, permitting and licensing law, and putting it into one reading. Even if you read it, uh, even if, if it means this to one department, it means uh, to another. So we started from the Organic Act because a lot of frustrated people in Guam are really, really frustrated and give up hope because when they try to build their own homes and stuff like that, they, they got, get into the stumbling block because maybe one person doesn't like it and, and holds it up. I'm not gonna say what's the department that ends with an O, but that's the problem. So what, what, I've, what I've done right now is to put this thing together and uh, hopefully um, the, uh, <laughs> The bill will come to fruition, the governor will send it over and, 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 and pass. But uh, the, uh, the other part of the tourism is, uh, I know you'll probably have some, some, some questions, but the tourism, the tourism part is, is right now we're trying to, and we announced it today, I asked the governor yesterday to, uh, to please just set aside 1,500 vaccines. Pfizer or Moderna, so that we can market for the expats in Japan, Korea, Taiwan. Just in that area of three areas, that's about 200,000. And then when you go to the Philippines, the Philippines have the dual citizens. They've been coming here. They've been getting their, their shots because they say they're residents here. But we cannot do that for tourists, simply because we haven't gotten enough vaccines for our own people. And the governor's priority is to make sure that the entire community is vaccine, vaccinated, those inoculate, those that, that want it, but we're encouraging everybody to do it. So I'm waiting for a response from the governor to give us that opportunity to test the validity of that kind of tourism, to start bringing these people over. In the beginning, four, five months ago, I came up with the idea to let's try this, but we knew we couldn't move forward because the vaccines had just started arriving here. And I said, why don't we do a program called Air v, &V. Bring these people here, they want to come here, and they want to work here for even the tourists. They want to come here and let's stay in condos, hotel rooms. We'll keep them here for, for four weeks. For four weeks to get their first vaccine and then get their second vaccine. Now that is taking hold, and the governor hopefully will see that 
she can spare 1500 just to test the validity. Because from what I understand right now, Johnson & Johnson are not very happy with the federal government of the United States because I guess they, they put that 11-day pause on them and then they're not paying them. So they're now marketing their, their JJ vaccine out in the, in the community. And uh, I know that nobody's jumping to get the JJ now as a vaccine, but I think it's spurring the movement of Pfizer and Moderna to also say, hey, we get more money too if we can start selling out to the, to the private sector. So that's what we want to do is to test this product out and because I think in a few weeks or a month that those two companies, former two companies will in fact start putting out uh, uh, vaccines for the tourists, for, for other than US citizens. Now Alaska is already working on in, inviting those tourists there. I don't know where they're getting all their vaccines, but I guess they got two senators there and two uh, representatives, we don't. But Mike San Nicholas, bless his heart, he probably could do it by himself over there to get us also getting some of these uh, vaccinations out here above the population base that we have here in Guam. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have a chance to do good with tourism. I think we're putting in place a lot of this uh, WTTC, World uh, Tourism uh, Council, and the SAFE Guam, SAFE certificate from the, uh, from the uh, University of Guam. And I'm the one actually certifying, and I hope, I don't see it here yet, though that's WTF, but uh, WTTC is what you want to see at the door. It's the SAFE certificate so that the tourists will feel safe the, visit, the Guam residents will feel safe. If you come into a door there and see WTTC certified and safe, uh, uh, Guam safe certified, and then especially when you see a big A like they have outside there from the public health and social services, I think that that's what we're doing is that we're, we're working through the so-called new normal and uh, the governor so fit to, to put the restaurants, for example, up to 75%, uh, and so that we are really now getting the employees to, to make it second nature on how to do this uh, safety and health uh, product that we're trying to sell for Guam. We cannot, we cannot sell Guam without them feeling that we're safe. I know that the uh, business community were disappointed, those in the industry, because the governor set it back again to May 15th, and who knows, I mean, the way it's spiking now, we may be delayed again, but not to worry, it's not a, our, our, our own call here just because we have a, uh, we're ready here. Japan, Korea, and Taiwan are not ready. They're having their own problems. They're not sending their own people out anywhere to travel. And they're not even up to 5% in the vaccination of their, of their citizens. But what we want to do is to set that protocol where we match their protocol on our protocol. So when they let them out, they know that they don't have to get quarantined when they get back home. And we're getting close to agreeing with, with those uh, countries right now. Now we have one Consul General, uh, I won't call him Consul General, but the, the, the Taiwan Economic and, and Cultural Office, for example. That's like a Consul General's office. There's just a way to get around the federal laws and, and the Nixon laws. But they are so helpful to us that they want to promote Taiwan. We're just underestimating what Taiwan could be. Taiwan has 23 to 24 million people. I think 17 million of them travel outside of Taiwan. And last year, the best we had was 28,000. They're the highest spender when they, when they come here. So we're setting that thing up right now. But knowing that the governor wants to go beyond tourism in respect to Taiwan, she wants him to, to get into more airlines coming here. We're trying to get more uh, uh, transshipment of cargo here. We're trying to do hospital tourism. Our people are now going to Taichung Hospital in Taiwan, more so than the Philippines. The Philippines have a problem there, but they, they've sent two, two planes here to take our people back to Taiwan to get uh, health care there. Now they've designated already five hospitals and 11 uh, uh, subsidiaries. So we have a lot of these things putting in place by Consul the Director General Paul Chen here and and Stephen Shu. So we're going to go there now and upgrade our office, our marketing office there, because I think it's one of the best of our, 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 our country representatives. 
so that we can do more than just tourism. We can open doors with other economic development. And another thing that we're working on, I've got the paperwork done. I just haven't brought it over to the governor yet. I know there's going to be some pushback from some members in the community. But we're going to try to get back into the beating a little bit of this cabotage law in, in airlines. Back in 2006, I don't know if you remember, but under Felix Camacho, that Jesse Lujan and the airport work out a petition to the Department of Transportation to get rid of that cabotage for Guam. The cabotage law says that you can, if, if somebody from the Philippines, for example, gets on Philippine Airlines, flies here, they can pick up passengers here and go to, to, the, to the state. Well, that's outlawed, but guess what? In 2006, we beat half of that. They allowed us to do that with cargo. But in two years, it expired because at that time, it came so suddenly, none of the, the business uh, airlines out in this part of the world had, had no planes that are fully cargo. They put cargo in the belly, and it's not feasible to take them onto the States. But now we have Taiwan already has a, another airline approved, by the way. Starlock has been approved to fly the United States, and Guam is one of them just waiting for the end of the year or next year for them to begin flying. But they also want to do this transshipment of, of, of cargo. And with that, I think the business community will, especially the hotels and restaurants, we got all the best vegetables and seafood stuff in Taiwan. That's only three hours away. And these people are our friends. They're also the China in Asia. Not China, America in Asia, like us. So, I don't know how you guys feel, but uh, don't, be, don't despair. We're making, making good of our downtime right now. People are now uh, realizing that poor money is going down the drain. People right now, it's a seller's market for employment. Nobody wants to work. Nobody wants to work. So we just have to wait and creep up on them so they can be running down the down the street looking for jobs. So if you guys have any questions, I'll be more than happy to, to, to answer. Um, what else is there that, uh, Paul, anything that you, you? Well, I'm thinking about the air cargo, so that with uh, the cabotage law, I'm not familiar, is that the same as kind of like the Jones Act? Or not like it is like the Jones Act. It's the fifth freedom they call in the airlines. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the first guys that are going to go up there and tell the U.S., no, don't approve it, are, are the U.S. airlines. But here's the catch. There's an airline here already, and they're going to fight it. And back in 2000, uh, 1998, 99, I even took money from the Federal Highway Funds and gave it to Jerry Yingley at the airport, because only territories are allowed to do that and to quickly expand the runway to 12,000 feet so we can do this nonstop flight out and in. Well, it was completed in 2015, hasn't been used. So I say, those people in Taiwan, in the Philippines, in Korea, I'm not sure about Japan, but I know of these three, they want to avail themselves of that fifth freedom to fly to Guam, pick up passengers, but not to Hawaii. Fly passengers over Hawaii, to San Francisco or where in the West Coast. And if those airlines that are here now serving Guam say no, then you fly it. They don't want to fly it, but they're holding it down like this. We want somebody that can fly it to fly it. That's why we put that runway to expand it like that. So they don't want to overfly. Hawaii doesn't want us to overfly them. They're making millions of dollars from our flights going there. You know, I'm not trying to downgrade any airlines or anything like that, but just check out all the rates yourself when you fly. But I noticed there are a lot of uh, United cargo flights that come um, direct flight from LA, San Francisco, even Alaska, UBS flights from Alaska here. It would be awesome if we could compensate um, those. Yeah, but you know, but we have we have senators that will fight us over there. You know, the Hawaii doesn't want to be overflowed anywhere. So we, we but if, if we don't get the passengers, for example, which I believe now they're going to give us a second look, they'll give us back the, the 2006 approval of cargo. Now, we never used it, and the federal government said, well, you never used it. Yeah, because it was like it came so quickly in one fell swoop. We had this, 
and nobody was prepared to fly it. So, and, and also, you know, when you do that, you've got to be really, in, your mind has got to be in cargo, full cargo planes coming here, bringing cargo here and taking cargo back to San Francisco or Las Vegas, wherever. But uh, that's what we're looking for. And they've done it once, and I believe that we can get it the second time. And this time we're going to have planes coming in. The governor really wants to develop that from Taiwan. That's why we're giving Taiwan a good eye on this, because it's not only tourists. But if we can get, you know, out of the 24 million, out of the 17 million that fly here, fly out of, uh, of Taiwan, around the world, we can just get, you know, like 1%. You're talking about 230,000 people instead of 28,000 people. So we're thinking outside the box right now, uh, and hopefully, GDB will operate as a as a, a government agency with a policy board, not a management board. Because sometimes they act like management, and that's not the way it's supposed to be. And everybody, if you're management, you know what? You're trying to hold on to wherever those monies are going to go. Let management handle it, and we're doing a good job with it right now with Jerry Paris and. If you know, Jerry Paris, thank God that I talked him into coming and working with me at GDB when the governor asked me to do that. Because he is like, he's actually a doctor in tourism. I don't know anybody else here. I know you're in environmental engineering, right? Yep. See, I remember you. <laughs> Kyle? Uh, yeah, with regards to tourism, specifically, how do you see the next uh, 24 months What's going to be the progression in terms of our activity, in terms of marketing, and just really reaching out, letting people know we're a safe destination? But also, we're you know kind of reminding them it's a fun escape destination. We're escaping it. Yeah. The, the well, one one gentleman, I'll, I'll I'll say his name. His name is Ray Gibson. I was on the radio with him, and he says, uh, "Gov, we're we're on category three of CDC." He says, "You know." You can't fly to Guam unless you have an essential reason to go there, right? You know, and so he said, why not use the word essential used for marketing? Which really hit just like that. Because I don't know if you remember back in 1998 when we marketed Guam, when we juxtaposed the destination to Hawaii versus Guam, and we did a, 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 an ad where two families are going in at the arena checking in. Very John T, they're on the plane. Three and a half hours later, they're swimming in the in front of Lucid Tani. Well, it's still at midnight flying to Hawaii, taking them all eight hours instead of three hours. So this is the same thing like you're saying. It's essential that you fly the Guam for your mental health and your physical health. That's what we're gonna use that phase and see what happens to it. Yay, three hours away, America and Asia. This is America. And the first thing that our marketers came up with when they took a survey, that Guam is the most trusted uh, vacation destination of Japan. That's what came out. And so we want to market that. Remember, America in Asia is, is, a, is a buzzword. But you know, uh, that's what we need to do, not only for, for tourism, but for telecommunications. We got more fiber optics leading in and out of Guam to the world than any place per capita. We've got to take advantage of that. But we don't also want anyone holding up the cable, under the sea cable, the Alupan, for example, because somebody doesn't necessarily like it. We're trying to move some of those stuff that are being hung up. We, uh, Rotary, were part of the Japan district. Uh, two years ago, we had a conference here on island, and a lot of the Rotarians that came, yes. at the time, they said, you know what you need? a direct flight from Canada to Guam. That's, that's going to be the big difference. But of course, they've limited the spot. Well, 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 let me tell you that we already applied because there's, there right now a lot of people left. So there's an opening. And uh, we have our intel and we sent our letter. The governor sent the letter to get that one spot to Guam. But we're being again fought by a bigger airlines that wanted to go to the long haul to the United States. So we're fighting ourselves. But the governor already wrote, we want Haneda, not for a long haul of an airline, but to Guam. 
So it's in the back, right? Not in the back, but in the in the in the mill, running through. So good you brought that up because the governor already sent that letter two and a half months ago. We're waiting. So uh, just to follow up on uh, future future block, uh, I was having a discussion with a bunch of craft beer uh, owners and artists, and people. And one of the things that's glaring on the law that's sort of uh, missing compared to other big destinations is districting, you know, like art, art district, you know, restaurant district. Is this something to promote? Red light district? Red light district, <laughs> and, and all of this came from like the cannabis conversation. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the, 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 the Ganya restoration, I think, within the Ganya, yeah. there could be smaller districts within saying, Oh, that's going to be our art district. Yeah. We're going to encourage, uh, you know, real estate owners, uh, business people to do art yeah. there. And, and so, well, just wanted to yeah. Well, you know, 24, 24 years ago when I was governor, yeah. we knew that we needed to do something. We got to set up a stage of Dumont. It was helter skelter there. And so that we got together with the industry people, the Bob Coles, the Al Dickens, the Israels, and we came together with what we're going to do. Kind of laid out a plan. And the plan was to set up that stage called Pleasure Island. And we did that. I mean, that's, a, that's, that's easier than what you're saying, because when you go to the Agana, uh, you know, restoration, that thing's a decades away to actually be accomplished. And you don't even know what it's going to be accomplished, because it's a difficult thing. But yes, you're right. But I don't know about this. You know, we're, we're not ready for, for cannabis to go into Tumon right now until we heal ourselves with this pandemic situation. We don't want a, something, on, you know, biting us on the side. Because Japan and Korea, they won't, they don't want to come here if we have free cannabis usage out here. So we don't want to do that. I know I'm getting uh, help from some of the cannabis, cannabisers, but uh, <laughs> not. Well, we are. We, it's more than possible. It's been possible since 2015, but it hasn't been used because it, they, they make more money flying the whole way. And when you go to what you know, and so it's there. It's been there now for like six years. This has had the recertification of the runway again going on right now. But you know, we spend millions of dollars to get that thing done, and then somebody holds us back because. You know, those big boy airlines are tougher with their pilot, you know, their lobbyists in, in Washington than we can get there with our one voice. But let me get back one more thing to, to those that are thinking, are we going to really get something accomplished with this czar? Well, let me say that, you know, uh, people, we start from the organic act. I started to say that the organic act says that you cannot be deprived of the use of your, your property. And so in the past, when, when Guam was opening up for major tourism, all these developers were coming in. And all these senators were writing laws to protect us from the unscrupulous uh, developers. But then the, the property owner's status got lost. So there's, in the organic access, you, you cannot deprive anybody in Guam of his use of his property. And they're forgetting that. But they are denying you when one guy can sit up there at uh, his office at VP and, and, and tell you no because uh, you know you got to do this and you got to do that, even if it doesn't say that. But that's his light. He's hugging something like a tree or like that. <laughs> it's true. So that, you know, I'm not saying rest assured, but rest a little bit more comfortable that, that when we write that law and we put it into one reading, that nobody is gonna, that one person cannot be dictating to what we as a citizen have a right for here in Guam. I was just gonna say, I opened up a new business in October of last year. What's the name of it? Guam Pet Hospital. <laughs> so we went through the permitting process. And the frustration that I had was just, I mean, I'm from California, so I'm used to the permitting process here being horrible. <laughs> And I came here, and I couldn't get the same answer over and over again. It's exactly what you're talking about. We got down to the end, right? The 
place is built, everything is done, I think we're ready to go. We replaced one sink in a, in a building that's 57 years old. We were required by an agency, not to remain nameless at this point, to do a lead water test, and it's going to be three weeks to delay our opening for replacing a stainless steel sink in our office. It's not a change, everything else. It was absolutely ridiculous. And I got to tell you that the people that were that I dealt with at the permit center were very, very helpful. But their frustrations with a particular agency, which I won't mention publicly, because I'm probably have to go back to them soon, because we're going to expand, uh, is just absolutely insane. And it was something you could feel the tension in the room of the frustration of the people working at the permit center. And I will tell you that the one the one person there, I'm just going to put a good shout out to, was Peter Trinidad, was extremely helpful in trying to straighten this straighten this out. And I want to mention him and call him out for being very very helpful and trying to explain this process because he did everything he could and eventually got a result because he could see what the ridiculousness does of the place is ready to open and we're now going to have to wait three weeks for a water test on something that is is. You can't change because it's the way it's written in the law. Into the law. Yeah. Well, it's never been, public has never been the problem. And Peter Trinidad did his best, but now you've got a guy named Randy Romero. And he is spot on, take charge. He is the head up there right now. We're working with him very closely. But now when you go in to apply for a, for a building permit, you get one form that is so busy you, you put everything together for commercial and residential and, and, and they don't tell you what, where to go first to get your clearance. And, and not only that, listen to this, because this is what Randy told me. I said, why do you have to have a guy go to the appeals board to certify that this contractor or this uh, engineer is licensed? It doesn't make sense. Why don't you just have a, a list at your office of the most recent approved from the appeals board, so you can check it out. He says, not that easy. They want those guys to go there so they can get some money. We're trying to change that. That's that's the problem. That so, these guys are all have their own freedoms, and uh, and then you can't break through. But now it's going to be broken through because the governor's going to take charge with this, and she's not going to allow this thing to go on the wayside. We're going to try to get results. That's what she wants: is results for the better. That's what you're saying. Well, and so this is my follow-up. What's the ETA on this? Because we've already outgrown the space that we're in, and we're looking at expanding to maybe as much as seven to eight times the facility we have. And I'm sitting here just okay. shaking in my shoes going, I, this process was literally probably took a year off my life. All right, but the overall picture is soon when when, when, when <laughs> we get done with the, when, when we get done, when we get done with the law, it's, it's about 80% done to submit to the governor to send to the legislature. But, Today? Yeah, well, we have to look at it first. <laughs> Make sure that you don't take my right. You don't believe you. I'd like to go back to Mill. Years ago, they went in and put in a one stop so they could go and have one stop to go to. Well, after a while, it began to work. This is just one stop. That's your first stop. Then they gave you 10 others to go. Can you get it to where? We can go to a one stop and get everything done in one place. Yes, that was uh, under my administration, right? Yes. All right. Okay, but here's now it's called the Business License and uh, Permitting Center. They've got six departments there. Revenue Tax is there now with uh, five divisions. They're all there. They're trying their best to do it now. The governor ordered that, and the lieutenant governor ordered that, and they're there. So hopefully that you don't have to go too far anywhere else, or they will hand carry it for you. But it's working now, it's called, it's not in a different name. Not One Stop Center, but the BLBC Center, the Business Licensing and Permitting Center. But it's there, at Public Works. So Public Works has never been the problem. Public Works right now is really working closely. You know why? When I went to GDB, I guess they put it in the newspaper more so than when I was in my old office. And all I do is get these phone calls about my permit is stuck there, I don't know why you're calling me. So they asked me, why are they calling you? I said, because I guess they can. Because I'm the only one that answers my phone call when it calls, right? So the governor said, well, okay, then you can be the czar. Give me another phone. 
But I've gotten, how many, how many have we gotten over the last two weeks of the same anecdotes that, that we're hearing now? And with that one, the one football association, for example, they're gonna lose their, their FIFA grant if we don't get them going. Now they're meeting tomorrow, hopefully it's done. We also have just a guy that wants to showcase his home down in Ipan and just couldn't get his, his uh, 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 permit for, for occupancy. It's done yesterday. Those are the things that you need to do is, we're prioritizing for those people that are ready to fold up and leave. But we'll get there, just give us a chance. This is not a, a show, this is not a fit and start, fits and start operation. This is going to get results in the end. The governor has said that to me, go out there and do everything you can, in, uh, but don't break any laws. And I won't break any laws. Yes, Ron? Break all the laws. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I know with GLUC you brought in some private secretaries like Dan Swayley and people like that to help with GLUC. You made changes right away that have been very effective. Yeah, especially for the private sector guys out there. Yeah. Because as of today, Guam is the hardest place on the planet. Thank you for bringing that up because when we put our group together three weeks ago, Dan Swakely was one of the front guys. Uh, Felix Villaventi and, and, and John Sherman, they, they came in and we, and we tried to look at all the, the problems from the user side. And then we put it all together, and that's what we're going to come up with, with one reading of the law. Now, uh, you know, uh, Dan was moving, trying to move the temporary workforce housing that got stuck. It got stuck somewhere, and uh, we went and got it passed in, in legislation. The governor signed it to law. Now they're, they're practically building, black construction is building, I don't know how many, for, for a thousand or so people for barracks. But they're there moving now because of the intercession of the office of the czar. Because I am bird dogging it. Not necessarily I have that much power, but I bring it to the attention of the public and to the governor if they don't do anything about it. That's, that's why the governor says, you be the czar. You speak in my behalf when you're standing there. And that's what's happening. Before in the past, I had no portfolio. They just think I'm just trying to. There's, you know, there's a lot of young people who would like to come back to Boston and open businesses trying to take advantage of what's going on about down a little bit and grow with the economy. And this is killing because yeah. they can't afford the power of the energy. So it's really important that you make this happen. Okay, another thing that's also causing our people not to be able to, you know, Siska, they came up with the, the analysis that it's right now averaging 375,000 for a residential home. The problem is that when you have CCU, Levying the the uh, the, uh, uh, the the fee for the, the system development charge. Well, I told the governor says we cannot, you know, we we cannot, of course, expect CCU to to put it themselves because they're acting like a business. But we can right now with that second tranche of money for economic development coming here. Is the is the coming upon the governor to take those funds necessary to go out there and extend the distribution lines and systems lines all the way from sewer to power. As I was being told that going up to, to Anderson, for example, there's no, from the left to the right side, there's no sewer or, or, or then you know you can't build there. So when you, the governor puts in tens of millions of dollars, working together with CCU, and I've spoken with Simon, Simon and I are gonna sit down and see how much he can dislodge on his own from the federal government and how much the governor can get and put it together so that we can go out there and put all those sewer lines in and put in those uh, water tanks and put in those, uh, those uh, 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 power poles so we can get these things, uh, you know, we don't charge our people $2,600 just to hook up to a meter. That's what's happening now. So we take charge of that. I, and the governor also agrees with that. Okay, uh, one more. When can, uh, when can returning residents come back to Guam without the equipment? Uh, well, first of all, nobody is going to be treated differently. Whatever happens to, to, uh, for the residents, it'll happen for the tourists. So as long as we're still on, uh, on, on the P-Court, three, uh, we're not going to uh, see any change. 
And uh, guys, I'm telling you, you know, we've seen the enemy and they are us. We, we can't, you know, like they, poor Chewbacca. Chewbacca got all kinds of negative stuff, but it wasn't their fault. They had the best protocol in place. Is these guys, when they go out, they go out and don't take their responsibility not to, to do what they're not supposed to do. And so it's us. And he's just monitoring it. It's going up to 1.1 now on the car, car store. And, and if you don't take charge with our own lives and, and our own protocols, we won't see this thing happening very soon. That would be a disaster. Exasperating? It would be a disaster for local people. If every time we do violence, we have to be Maybe more of a disaster if we, if we have something going on like they're having going in India right now, believe me. Well, we're not going to have to. We don't have a big force. Yeah, but you know, <laughs> take it in perspective, you know, and it's relevant. But, but it is. I mean, we have 138 de deaths already on the uh, pandemic. Yeah, but none of them all, they all Maybe not. I'm not a doctor, but I'm just reading what it is. And not none of them. No. Not all of them. I know. No, 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 no. no. Some died with COVID. Okay. There's probably 99% didn't die because. Four people died. We just didn't report it everything. We didn't report everything. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you, but the hospital capacity is something you have to look out for. If you don't have that hospital capacity right now. If you have a negative test and you've been vaccinated and you still have to be put in prison when you come back to Guam, why in the hell wear a mask? Why in the hell get vaccinated? Why do anything if you don't get anything for it except put in jail? Well, you know what? Uh, I'm glad that I'm not a new young girl. He had to make that decision. Believe me. It's easy for her to talk here like that. And it seems like for your own personal beliefs, you may be right. But she's thinking, you know, she's hovering over this island, watching the, the population. And she's not going to allow something where she can't even depend on her own people to follow the protocol. You know? I, well, we'll get there, we'll get there. Ron, we'll get there. Give us time so we can do your, your permitting stuff first. 14 months already. We started with two weeks. Two weeks turned into 14 months. It's not, it's not. <laughs> if we're not getting any benefit out of doing it right, there's no benefit to doing it right. If people move around, believe me, if, if, if maybe we didn't bring our planes in from the States uh, to Guam with our residents, it wouldn't be like this either. You know, we could have closed it down, it would have been a bigger problem. You would have been yelling even more. But it's something that we, you and I didn't make the decision on, and I, I applaud the governor for having the courage to do what she's doing. Because I believe she's right right now. As you can see, protocols were put in place, but it's the individual out there in the community that's not following. Just for the record, she's absolutely wrong. In my opinion, she's absolutely wrong. Yeah, that's your opinion, yeah. Thank you. I think you already have one of these, but now you're not there. That's what broke.